from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello. Geraldine was born and raised in Australia, which accounts for her lovely accent. She came to the United States to complete a master's degree at Columbia University and soon got a job at the Wall Street Journal covering conflicts in Africa, the Balkans, and the Middle East. That experience provided the material for her first book, Nine Parts of Desire, The Hidden World of Islamic Women, which was an international bestseller. Several years later, after winning an overseas press club award for her coverage of the Gulf War, she took off the journalist's cap and wrote a novel called Year of Wonders about an English woman during the plague of 1666. Encouraged by the tremendous success of that book, she published a second one called March, based on the life of Bronson Alcott and the father figure in Little Women. It won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 2006. That was one of those years when they actually gave a Pulitzer Prize in fiction. <laughs> Since then, she's published two more novels, People of the Book and the... <clears throat> and the novel she'll talk about today, Caleb's Crossing, which takes place on Martha's Vineyard. It imagines the life of the almost lost in the shadows of history, the first Native American to graduate from Harvard College in 1665. Ms. Brooks lives on Martha's Vineyard with her new horse, two boys, and her husband, the writer Tony Horowitz, who is also here at the festival this week. If you'd like to get your book autographed by Ms. Brooks, she'll be at the signing tent at 4 o'clock. Please welcome me in, please join me in welcoming Geraldine Brooks. Well, good day. <laughs> what an amazing crowd. Uh, it's fantastic. This, I love this event. This is one of the greatest festivals, I think, in, in the world because uh, what could be more beautiful than a beautiful day on the mall and uh, seeing people in line to go into a bookstore. It's just thrilling for a writer. Um, I wanted to start by reflecting that probably there are a few people in here that feel the same way as I do about flat screen TVs. It seemed like a, the minute that they invented the flat screen TV, everywhere there was a flat surface, you suddenly had to have one. So now we even have one on the boat that goes to Martha's Vineyard. So instead of watching one of the most beautiful waterways in the world unfold in front of you, people sit and listen to bloviators on Fox News for the entire <laughs> trip. But I was particularly irritated when I went for my annual checkup because when I go to the doctors, I like to read an out of date magazine. <laughs> but there was a TV screen, and on it was Oprah's show. And I can't really be mad about Oprah's show given what she's done for fiction. So I found myself, against my will, not reading my magazine but watching the show because the segment was so riveting. And it was about a woman who was filming her boyfriend, and they're on a sports fishing expedition, and he had hooked a magnificent swordfish. And as she's videotaping, the fish is breaching as it fights for its life, and the sun is gleaming on this ball of muscle hurtling through the air. And I am so barracking for the fish. Then all of a sudden, the fish turns in midair and is coming straight for the boat. And her cries of delight about her boyfriend's prowess turn to screams of horror as the video goes all blurry and the sword pierces her chest. But she didn't die. Why? Because the gooey contents of her silicon breast implant... <laughs> slowed the progress of the sword and diverted it away from her vital organs. <laughs> so she's there holding up the x-rays and Oprah is, you know, remarking on how extraordinary this is. My magazine is on the floor. <laughs> my chin is on my chest and I'm going, you could not make that up. <laughs> And that should be a very depressing thing for a novelist to ever have to say. <laughs> but I realized something that day, which is that actually, that is how I find an idea for a novel, is the thing that actually happened 
that you couldn't make up. Because if I came here today and I'd written a book that was a completely fictional account of how a young man born and raised in his own Native American culture on faraway Martha's Vineyard Island in the 1660s, graduated from Harvard, speaking Latin and Greek fluently, and I'd just fabricated that, nobody would want to read it. It would be too implausible. As, as Mark Twain said, fiction must be plausible. Truth needn't be. <laughs> so how does a writer born and raised in faraway Sydney, Australia, end up writing a novel about the first Native American graduate of Harvard College? It's a story that begins in a galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. When I was in um, the fourth grade of my elementary school in suburban Sydney, and a TV show called Star Trek arrived on our TV screens. I loved that show. I became obsessed with the Vulcan science officer, Mr. Spock. <laughs> in the original Vulcan, Lashdoro Visukra, that's what a hard case I was. So I, I joined the Leonard Nimoy fan club and eventually the fan club newsletter found its way to Sydney. And in it was a list of names of similarly tragic Trekkies in America who were looking for pen pals. I thought, oh great, I've bored the pants off everybody I actually know. Now I can write boring letters to somebody who's equally intrigued by this. And so I wrote away to a girl my, my same age and eventually the um, answer came back, postmarked from a town called Menemsha. I couldn't pronounce it, I didn't know where it was. But luckily I had an older sister who was a bit better informed than I was about matters of popular culture and she knew about Carly Simon and James Taylor and she knew that they lived on the island of Martha's Vineyard so she was able to enlighten me and that she said it's a pretty cool place. And so we wrote to each other for years and every summer this pen pal would send me beautiful postcards of Menemsha sunsets and I was absolutely convinced that these were doctored. No, no sunset could be so beautiful. So in due course, I, I got a scholarship to come to the United States and do the master's program at Columbia Journalism School. And my plan was just to, to get that master's degree and then get back to Sydney and get on with my real life. But there was one place in America that I really wanted to visit before my return journey, and that was this Menemsha. So I happened to mention it to a classmate at the journalism school and he said, oh yeah, I know that place. My best friend has a place right near there and I visit every summer. In fact, I'm going this Labor Day weekend. You should come with me. And I did. And to cut a long story short, Rita, I married him. <laughs> And we went off adventuring around the world for the next 11 years as foreign correspondents. But every time we had home leave, we'd try and time it for exactly this time of year, which is the most beautiful time on the vineyard. And um, as you do with a summer place that you particularly love, we would, every year we would say, gee, I wonder what it's like to live here year round. Well, now we know. <laughs> Very strange thing happens around about Labor Day and it's as if somebody picks up the island by both ends and flips it up and all the people fall off. And then you can look around and see who your neighbors really are. And I was intrigued for the first time to find that I had Native American neighbors, the Wampanoag people who've lived on Martha's Vineyard for millennia. And I wanted to know more about their culture and their history. And so I went by the tribal office and Luckily for me, they're fantastic custodians of their past and there was a great wealth of material. Uh, and I took home a map that they had made of the island that showed all the Wampanoag place names and all the sites of uh, religious and cultural significance to the tribe over the, over the millennia. And on it was a notation right near where we were then living that said birthplace of first Native American to graduate from Harvard. And I thought, 
how cool, maybe I'll run into him at the farmer's market or the library. <laughs> because my mind was not ready to read the date, 1665. I wanted to see 1965, because it, it seemed to me that that was a plausible date for that great white male bastion of waspy super privilege to have opened its doors to a Native American. Well, that's so much did I know, but the foundational document of Harvard, the Harvard Charter, states that the purpose of the college is the education of English and Indian youth of this country in knowledge and godliness. So right from the outset, that was part of the mission of Harvard. But that mission clearly had been lost somewhere along the line. Um, but at the time uh, that this young man was identified as a talented scholar, it was still true that Harvard had an Indian college, the best building they actually had. The other college was falling down pretty soon after it was built. And, you know, it so many things intrigued me. And I think you know that you're on to something when you have a million questions that you want answered. And I wanted to know how this young man had learned Latin because in those days, Harvard's instruction was entirely conducted in that language. Um, how had he come to make this vast cultural journey? But also, I had more basic questions like, Harvard? in 1665, because that's 100 years before the white history of Australia even begins, and already there's Harvard. And so I found out that Harvard was actually founded in 1636. The, the um, pilgrims had barely set their feet down on these shores, and they're already thinking college, because that was the kind of guys they were. And it was all guys, of course, in those days. And then I wanted to know about Caleb, what was known about him? So I went back to um, the Wampanoag tribe, and some of the younger tribal members were quite funny. They would go, oh, Caleb. <laughs> Caleb, our parents were always beating us over the head with Caleb. <laughs> if I got a B on an assignment or if my homework was late, they'd go, Caleb was graduating from Harvard in 1665. <laughs> Get to work. So. His memory was very treasured within the tribe, but not widely known outside of it. And sadly, we know very little about him beyond the bare facts of his life, that he was the son of a chieftain of one of the smaller bands of Wampanoag, um, that he was um, educated by the English minister in uh, English and literacy, and then sent off the island to prep school uh, to be prepared to matriculate to Harvard, and that he was a remarkable scholar and he graduated. Um, and I'm not gonna say what happens next for those who haven't read the book, but of what it was like to be him and the circumstances of his journey, nothing remains on the historical record. We only have one document from his own hand, which is a letter he wrote thanking the donors who had funded his education. And we only have that letter because it was sent to England. Because paper was such a scarce commodity in the early colonial period in the United States, well, it wasn't the United States then, but in this country, that every piece of paper was used over and over again. In fact, I was horrified to learn that the papers of Harvard's president in the 1660s were actually sent to the local bakery to line bread tins, so we have nothing from the president of Harvard at that time either, which is totally different to today. Drew Gilpin Faust told me that she is afraid to even do a doodle when she's on a phone call because somebody will come and grab it from under her hand, carry it away and put it in a glassine envelope and file it for posterity. So it's a very different time. But I didn't know who was going to tell this story. I wasn't sure that Caleb, for me, I have to hear a voice. I love to write with a first person narrator. So somebody from the past actually has to decide to rise up out of the grave and start talking to me. I've had a lot of trouble explaining this to my kids. <laughs> One uh, memorable day I had been reading to my young son and I said, you know, I have to uh, stop now because it's time for mum to go to work. 
So I went up, I set him up with a game and I went up to my study and after a little while I hear footsteps on the stairs and I get the sense of eyes boring into the back of my neck and I turn around and he's looking at me with a disgusted expression on his face. You said you were working. <laughs> I am working, darling. No, you're not. You're just sitting there. <laughs> but mummy is trying to hear the voices of people who've been dead for a very long time. <laughs> well, you can see that, that you know, it's, it's a little hard to explain, but it is exactly what I do. I love the dead. I didn't tell my son that because I didn't want him going off and telling the, his teacher that not only was his mother speaking to ghosts, but she was actually a necrophiliac. But <laughs> I do love them. I, love, I get some of my best ideas in graveyards, and lucky for me, there's some remarkable graveyards in Martha's Vineyard. So I didn't think that Caleb was going to be the voice. I thought Caleb might possibly speak to me in the language of his life as an intellectual and the scholar he became at Harvard. He might speak to me in Latin, but I didn't think that he would speak to me in the Wampanoag language of his heart, the language of his childhood, the language of his people and his family. The facts are, we just don't have the facts. We don't know enough about what it was like to be him. There are no accounts that I could have turned to to try and, to try and channel that voice. And so I thought, who is going to be the storyteller here? And the storyteller was suggested to me by one of the slender facts that we know about Caleb, which is that when he left the island to go to prep school, Another young Wampanoag youth went with him, um, and also the son of the minister who had instructed him went to this prep school. And the two young Wampanoags succeeded and matriculated to Harvard, but the minister's son bombed. He dropped out and he went back to the island. And I started to wonder how he felt about this. And this is where the novelist's wheels start spinning. I started to wonder whether he was angry at his father, that his father had got so wrapped up in the mission of educating young Native Americans that maybe he'd neglected his own son's education. I started to think maybe he was, it was a disgrace for him that these young Indians could do what he had failed to do. And I started to think about his character and I thought, who would be an objective set of eyes on this situation? And I thought, Maybe there's a sister, and maybe she wishes she could get the education that her brother is getting. And then suddenly I start pulling in thoughts and experiences from my time as a foreign correspondent, and I started to think about a young Afghan woman I'd heard about who was banned from going to school by the Taliban. And she actually stole her education. When her brother would go off to the madrasa, the school next door, she would climb up on the roof and climb over the roofs until she got to where she could, from hiding, overhear the classes in the courtyard of the madrasa. And when her brother came home from school, she would have learned more than he learned and she would do his homework for him. And so I decided to borrow the details of her life and transpose them onto the life of a totally imaginary Puritan daughter of a minister on Martha's Vineyard. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to hear her voice, so I better go and read some writings by young Puritan women from the colonial period. Disappointing, there aren't any. There are no women's journals before 1700 in colonial America, and no really interesting ones till 1750. Very few letters, and I soon learned why. The why is that while it was considered desirable for Puritan women to know how to read, so they could read their Bible to their kids, writing was considered an entirely male task. Because when you write, you communicate with people outside your own family. And why would any Puritan good wife need to be doing that? So very few women knew how to write. 
And that was true uh, well into the following century, actually. Benjamin Franklin's sister, who was probably as brilliant as he was, was barely literate in her ability to write letters to her brother. So where am I going to go to hear this voice? Well, I'd written another book set in the 17th century. And again, there was a problem with literacy for my, the people that I wanted to explore the lives of women in a remote mining village in the Pennines. And I had found that where you go to hear women's voices in that period is court. Because in courts, in the magistrates' courts and the local courts and the church courts, somebody who was literate took verbatim testimony. And women were always being dragged in, accused of all kinds of outlandish crimes like being a scold. And being a scold meant that you'd been overheard criticizing a man in public. It's a good thing that one's not still on the books. <laughs> Well, the audience would be very thin. <laughs> anyway, you do find women accounting for themselves and talking about what's on their mind and talking about their grievances as they defend themselves from these charges. So that was where I was able to get the sound of my narrator's voice, Bethia. And I imagined Bethia meeting Caleb as a child. And the two of them had nothing in common. They have a completely different lifestyle, a completely different idea of what's godly, how you live on the land, how you raise your children. But the one thing they have in common is this great love of learning and the willingness to pursue it, no matter what risks and costs it has for themselves. So suddenly I had the narrative structure of how I was going to tell that story. Um, I'm going to uh, digress for a minute because uh, one of the things that they ask that we do um, at this festival particularly is talk about how you became a writer. So I'm just going to give you the brief um, rundown of how I found myself a novelist. I didn't set out to be a novelist. I wanted to be a journalist um, from the time I was eight years old. My father was a proofreader on a newspaper in Sydney. Proofreaders, wonderful thing. Pity we don't have them anymore. Um, and one day my mum took me in to see him at work and it was right when the presses were rolling for the afternoon edition. And the, the press floor was amazing to an eight-year-old child. The size of the rolls of newsprint, the mist of ink in the air, the incredible noise and the vibration coming through the floor as the presses start to roll and then the newsprints flying across the room and then boom, 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 the papers start emerging onto the conveyor belt and my dad reached out and grabbed one and handed it to me. And it was warm. <laughs> it was hot off the presses. <laughs> and I looked down and I read the headline and I thought, I am the first person in this city that knows what's going on today. And I wanted to be part of that. So. When I went off to college, I thought, well, what, what will make them hire me? What can I study that will help me to get a job as a reporter? And I read the paper and I saw there's a ton of politics in it, but there's an awful lot of cultural coverage too. So I thought, I'll cover the waterfront here. I'll do a degree in government and fine arts. So four years later, I emerge fabulously well informed about the uses of tempera in Quattrocento Italian painting and classical political theory from Plato to Hobbes. So they sent me to the sports department to cover the horse races. <laughs> Not really cover them. I, I, my job was to take the details, which meant that I had to get all this reams of facts for every horse in every race meeting, what the odds started at, what they went out to, what the condition of the track was, what the weights were, what the handicaps, who was the jockey, what their colour, just tons and tons of little facts. And I hated that job. It was very stressful because after all the race meetings, you had to go back to the paper and actually check um, the, the early edition before the presses rolled because unbelievable as it seems in this day and age, Rural bookmakers actually paid out on the results as reported in the first edition of the newspaper. So if I made a mistake, I would be terminated and not just by the newspaper. So it gave me a great respect for facts and 
that's useful for a journalist, but it's also very useful for the kind of novelist I wound up being because the better the factual scaffolding on which I build my edifice, the more ridiculously extravagant the imaginative ed edifice can be. But you have to have the factual scaffolding to support it. Otherwise, I can't carry you with me on a believable journey into the past. So I'm very grateful to that early journalistic career. And the other um, aspect of my journalistic career I'm grateful for came rather near the end of it. And um, when people say, how did you become a novelist? I have to say that I have the Nigerian secret police to thank for it. Because after Columbia, I got hired by the Wall Street Journal and covered conflicts. Um, my beat was being a fireman going into troubled places. And I had gone to Nigeria because we'd heard that Shell Oil Company um, was behaving nefariously in the Niger Delta in a way that they would never behave in the first world and that they had left oil spills uncleaned up for 35 years and polluted water supplies and farmland for the desperately poor people of the Agoni region. So I went there to check it out and I found that it was even worse than had been described because Shell had actually got into cahoots with the brutal military dictatorship of Sunny Abacha and called in the army to fire on peaceful demonstrators there. And um, so as you do as a journalist, after I'd collected testimony from the people who'd been fired upon, I went to the military to get their side of the story. Big mistake. <laughs> they handed me over to the secret police and they threw me in a lockup. And I'm lying there on this concrete floor and I'm wondering how long they're going to detain me. And they come in and they fingerprint me and they mugshot me and I thinking about other journalists who've been detained and I'm thinking about Terry Anderson and his eight year detention in a Beirut dungeon and I suddenly go, eight years? If they keep me that long, I'll be too old to get pregnant. <laughs> Luckily, they deported me after three days and I got home and I greeted Tony with more than usual enthusiasm <laughs> and our son was born the following year. Oops, that's my timer. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> ah, stop it. I hate cell phones. Can I step on it? <laughs> All right, stop it. All right, I think it's doing it now. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to end rather inelegantly there just to say that at that point, I knew that I didn't want to go adventuring around the world on open-ended assignments to places where I might get thrown in the slammer anymore. And so I needed a new gig, and I thought about um, this town that I'd stumbled into one beautiful summer day in England when I was on leave from covering conflict in the Middle East, and the story of how plague had come to this village, and the people had taken the unique decision to quarantine themselves rather than flee and spread the infection to the surrounding communities. And that was, I guess, my first swordfish silicon breast <laughs> moment. And luckily, people read that book and I got to write some more. And I'm going to keep doing it for as long as you guys let me get away with it. Thank you. And I would be delighted to uh, take questions. We've got two microphones here, and um, yeah. Um, hi, I'm a high school student. I'm a huge fan. Thank um, you. My, the first book I read of yours was Nine Hearts of Desire, and it had many inspirational, a lot, and a very horrific, some mm -hmm. very horrific stories about women's condition in the Middle East. And um, regarding the events that have recently happened in the Middle East, um, what is your opinion on? how, um, if the position of women is going to change and if there's anything we can do about it. So the, the depressing thing about that book is that it's based on reporting that I did in the late 80s and early 90s and sadly, to the extent that there's been change in most places, it's been in the wrong direction. So I would have hoped that that book was completely irrelevant by now, but sadly it's not. It still um, contains a lot of truth about the plight of women. I think that what 
you can do about it is get to know the Muslims in our own community better because Muslim women here are doing an immense amount um, to reclaim the positive messages about women that exist in Islamic texts. And they write a wonderful magazine called Sisters in Seattle, which is translated into Arabic and sent back. And it is a corrective to the non-Islamic, patriarchal, cultural baggage that has been overlaid on what needn't be um, a situation that totally inhibits women's right to education and to a loving marriage and to rights in marriage and to personal status. So I think by supporting American Muslim women is the best thing that we can do. There, there was a course offered um, through Politics and Prose last spring called Well, um, well Behaved Women Rarely Make History. <laughs> yeah. And there were a number of books recommended to read about very strong women in American history, many of whom none of us have ever heard of in our history books. And Caleb's Crossing was one of the books that was recommended. Mm -hmm. And at first it sounded ironic because it was Caleb's Crossing. It was about Caleb Crossing. Mm -hmm. But it obviously was so much more, and it re was really about... Bathia's voice. And um, I guess I, on behalf of the rest of the women who took this course, want to thank you for this very strong story about this wonderfully strong woman who made it possible for Caleb to be <laughs> successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm also a, a student at Georgetown University. And I'm in an American Studies class, and we're studying the relationship between the first American settlers and the Native Americans. And I was wondering, how do you think the story of Caleb's Crossing reflects that first relationship and how the Puritans took advantage of the Native Americans, or if you think the story um, goes against that belief? I think it, it's both, actually. And one of, the, one of the challenges in writing about this time period was to try and realize that my characters don't know what I know. They don't know what's coming. They don't know about the bloodshed and the dispossession and the genocide that is coming because at this moment in history, none of that has happened yet. Uh, and there's still a possibility that the two peoples could have found a way to share the land in peace. And so you have to kind of clear away what we know and try and see history forward through their eyes instead of backward through my eyes. I think that the story is capable of multiple interpretations. Okay, so Harvard wanted to educate Indian youth. That goes in the tick column, right? Well, maybe not because they wanted to educate Indian youth so that they could deculturize the Native Americans. The initial idea was that they would have a cadre of ministers of religion from within the native population who would go out and Christianize and get rid of the you know, so-called barbaric, savage ideas and the beautiful Native American cosmology would be torn apart. And also there was a secondary thing going on which was that Harvard was very poor. It was not the well-endowed institution that we all know today. Larry Summers notwithstanding. <laughs> yeah, I heard Elizabeth Warren speaking about what he did to Harvard's endowment. She said, Larry Summers turned Harvard into a hedge fund and then bet against Goldman Sachs. <laughs> anyway, um, digression. Harvard, the buildings were falling down. They didn't have enough fuel to keep the scholars warm. They didn't have food for them. They relied on donations of food. Um, the one source of cash that they had were English um, religious people who were zealous to see Christianity brought to the native people of this country and couldn't believe what a slow business the pilgrims were making of it. And so they gave money to further this. They gave the money to build the Indian College to support the scholars in their studies. And I don't know if, how many of you have ever done any fundraising, but if you're a fundraiser, you really need some chum in the water. And sadly, the Indians were often used as a fundraising tool. Give us the money. And then the Indian College ended up being inhabited by English students because it was a better building. And very few Indians actually ever occupied it. So 
Um, I think that the story tells you many different things. I don't, uh, that's one of the reasons I like it, is that it is a complicated, it's not a black and white story. The minister on Martha's Vineyard acted with the greatest goodwill in the world. He was trying to give the people the most valuable thing he had, which was his understanding of God. The fact that they didn't want it, he couldn't, he couldn't grasp it. And one of my favorite um, resources for researching this book is uh, the journals of a, of a minister named John Cotton, who was sent to Martha's Vineyard as a punishment after he'd been caught stooping one of his parishioners. <laughs> And so he's sent to, to, to do a year of missionary work on the island. And lucky for us, he kept wonderful notes of all the questions that were asked of him by a very, very skeptical Native American population. And my favorite exchange is all about sin and original sin. And I've used it, I've, you know, stolen it basically from his journal and, and given it as a dialogue between Caleb and Bethiah. She's trying to explain Eden and the fall and all that. And... Uh, in John Cotton's journal, it said, my first difficulty was getting them uh, to accept the concept of sin, of which they had no ready concept. Um, they did not believe that they themselves were sinners and seemed much offended when I assured them of it. <laughs> Original sin, they said that the story of a god creating a garden for his children and then forbidding them to eat its fruit made no sense to them. And even if this unlikely outlandish story were true... Why would God be mad at them about it, who only heard about it today? <laughs> so that was what he was up against. And, but what I was trying to say is that the intentions were good, the effects were terrible in the end. So it's a story of, of dark and light. And, you know, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Could you comment on what gave you the inspiration for people of the book? Oh, that was um, while I was a reporter still working uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And my beat at that time was covering the UN. So I was in Sarajevo to write about what the UN was and was not doing in the city under siege. And it was really, I mean, even by the harsh yardstick of war, that was a brutal war because it was a war against civilians. But it was also a war against the idea that those civilians embodied, which is that people of difference, different ethnicities and different faiths could live together in a harmonious and productive society, which is what Sarajevo had been for hundreds of years. And when you go to war against that idea, you not only kill the people, but you ha try to destroy any record that such a people did thrive. So libraries were targeted, museums were targeted. Um, and when you went to Sarajevo during the siege, there was only one functioning hotel in the entire city, and that was the um, rather inaptly named, given the circumstances, Holiday Inn. And when you checked into the Holiday Inn, you did not want to be asking for a room with a view, because if you could see the mountains that rise like a bowl sort of cradling the city, the artillerymen and the snipers on those mountains could see you. So almost every window had been shut out facing the mountains and people huddled in the hallways in sleeping bags and so forth. But so for some reason, um, they managed to keep the bar open and journalists like a bar. And so one night in the bar, you know, talk would turn to what we'd been covering during the day and one night talk turned to this missing masterpiece of the Sarajevo National Museum, this illuminated manuscript that had survived from 14th century Spain, and it was missing and nobody knew its fate. But journalists, um, as, as much as they like a drink, they like a good rumor. And so the rumors were flying about the fate of this book that the Muslim government had sold it on the black market to buy weapons, that Mossad had sent in a team through a secret tunnel under the airport and taken the book to safety in Israel. And I, I found all this very interesting and I thought, oh, I must look into that. And, you know, way leads on to way and I didn't get back to it. And then at the end of the war, the book was brought out for the Passover celebration of the Jewish community in Sarajevo. And the truth was disclosed and it was even more remarkable than the rumors, which was that a Muslim librarian 
had risked his life in the early days of the shelling and gone in at great personal risk to bring this book to a safe hiding place. And I guess that was my swordfish silicon breast <laughs> moment for that book. Hi. Um, so I'm also a high school student. I love your books. And you. um, so this isn't quite as intellectual of a question as the rest of them, but I recently wrote a term paper on women's suffrage, which is a wonderful story and I loved it and it was so interesting, but after three months of the library, um, you do tend to get bored. So I was wondering, do you ever get bored even though your subjects are just like so interesting? No, because here's the trick, and you can't do this with a term paper, sadly. <laughs> but when you're writing fiction, you let the story tell you what you need to know. So, and I got this tip from Charles Frazier who wrote one of my favorite books ever called Mountain and it took him about 11 years to write. And somewhere around year seven, his wife who is an accountant said, Chuck, you gotta stop researching and write and from now on, you're not going to the library until you need to know three things and you have to show me what they are. <laughs> And then you go and find them out and then you come back and you write this novel and that's how it got finished. So he told us that story uh, to great hilarity around the dinner table, but I took it on board and I'm not quite that strict with myself, but I do my research and my writing interlocked like this. So I let the story drive the narrative and then when I get to a point where I don't know something, I go and look it up. So for example, when Bethia meets Caleb, she's clamming. Well, what did you use to clam in those days? So I have to go find out. What, what was she wearing? What was he wearing? And, you know, so those, your research is driven by the needs of a story that you're dying to tell. So that saves you from burnout and boredom. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you had a specific place, especially when you're facing writer's block that you like to go to write, especially on the island or um, whether it's in your house, anything? Okay, so um, when I'm facing writer's block, do I have a special place I like to go? We're not allowed to have writer's block, okay? Um, when you're a newspaper reporter, you have to write. You cannot tell your desk that the mot juste was unarriving today. <laughs> You file a story or you fail and you're out on the street. So that was a wonderful discipline. I, I, I had this editor in Sydney who was beyond crusty. Like this man was a week old baguette. <laughs> and I was, I was writing some deathless prose about a terrible tragedy that had happened in a mine south of Sydney and I was pouring my heart and soul into it and it's still typewriter time, right? And I'm typing away and he comes up behind me and says, where's the copy? Well, actually he said, where's the blank, blank, blank copy? And I said, I'm just trying to figure out how to end it. And he said, end it, end it, I'll end it. And he leaned over and hit E-N-D and tore it out of my <laughs> So you learn to be unprecious about writing. And as I've thought about this over the years, I think, why would you have writer's block? You never hear about hairdresser's block or proctologist's block. <laughs> so why, do, why are writers the only people who get to say, I can't work today? No, you go to work. And you might aspire to art, right? But you have to start with craft. And I live in a place with beautiful stone walls. And I think building a stone wall is a lot like writing because you pick up every word and it's like your stone and you lay them one on top of another. And some days the wall goes up straight and true and beautiful and other days you can't find the right rock and you get frustrated and you cram it in anyway and the effect is unsightly and the balance is poor and when you come back you can't stand to look at it so you have to bring in the backhoe push the whole thing over but if you do it every day if you never have a day without lifting up stones and putting them in place in the ends You'll have a wall, and if you're lucky, it'll be a beautiful wall, and it'll last 100 years. So um, I don't have a special place. I don't 
um, have a special pen. I move around all the time. In the summer, I love nothing better than to go and sit out under the apple tree and write there. In winter, I, if nobody else is in the house, I sit by the fire in the kitchen and do it there. So that's how it works for me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.